Hello. Hi, everyone who's joining us today. I'm Shannon McFarland with Product Marketing here at Intizer. And I'm joined today by Shaul Holtzman, our Sales Director of Engineering. And what we're going to be focused on talking about today is scaling your SOC with Sentinel One and Intizer. And so Shaul is going to really look at from kind of a SOC manager's perspective, you know, how can you really make sure that your team, whether you're, you know, one piece person or 10 people or 20 people, how can you be the most efficient in how you're triaging alerts, responding as quickly as possible, speeding up your investigation time and having more time to do threat hunting. And especially for small teams, that's a challenge because you're really doing a lot and often don't even don't necessarily have all the skills you need for deeper things like malware analysis or forensics. So how do you fit all that in? So with that, Shal, I'll pass it over to you. And for anyone who has questions or anything like that, I'm going to be in the chat during uh, while Shal's going over some things. So if you have questions, feel free to message me there and I'll try and watch for questions and we can answer some of those later on. All right, Thank Shal, you. it's you. Thank you so much, Shannon. Uh, so again, my name is Shaul. Um, some of you might have seen me in, in videos from Intezer or other webinars. Um, and just a, a few uh, words about myself. I've been at Intezer for the past uh, five years, almost working in pre-sales. Um, and before that, I worked in incident response, uh, focusing on malware analysis and forensics. Um, so uh, I think the field that we're talking about now um, is, is extremely relevant and very much developing in the past few years. Um, so I'll be happy to provide some information on what we do and how that can help um, SOC teams and instant response teams to actually handle the load of alerts, of investigations, and have time for the real important stuff. So focusing, of course, on true positives and also conducting uh, what everyone wants to do, proper hunting um, and forensic investigations. Um, but no one has the time. So I'm going to start with just a few slides. Um, if someone has been in, in the past webinars, uh, they, they uh, will be, uh, you know, recognizable. I'm going to go over them quickly. The goal is for you to understand what Intezer does at a high level um, and at an architecture level, so you understand what connects to what and where and how. And then I'm just going to go to the demo. Now, as Shannon mentioned, uh, here we're going to focus on the uh, our integration with Sentinel-1. Um, this is just this webinar. We have different events and webinars and videos on connecting to other alerting sources, other security uh, platforms. Um, but generally, um, whatever I say about Sentinel-1, uh, you can assume that that would work with our other integrations with other EDRs, for example. And sorry, my dog is really excited, by it, but uh, I think that it, it filters out a little bit. So you're, you're missing out on a lot of barking. So let's start. Uh, the problem in the field is quite simple. There is a resource shortage. It doesn't mean that analysts are not doing their job well, it just means that there's more alerts than humanly is possible to investigate. It's not the analyst's fault. It's not your engineer's fault. It's like, I can blame detection solutions, but it's not their fault either. Their job is to detect suspicious behavior, uh, suspicious activity, files, uh, and uh, network communication, etc. And that's a very difficult task. So in order to detect properly by definition, and I think it's not controversial to say, you will get false positives. It's part of the package because if you want to identify the real threat with that real threat, you'll get two, five, 10 false positives that did look suspicious to the machine learning model, to the AI algorithm, um, but with a, a bit more scrutiny, you can you know, remove that as a false positive, as uh, an unwanted software. Um, so that detection currently is what's holding down the SOC teams with 
more accurate detection or a second stage of filtering and triage, suddenly everything can be a bit a bit easier and uh, easier to to handle. And I'll explain how. Again, it, 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 you know, a few years back, uh, people were complaining about you know a lack of detection capabilities. Today, there's too much detection, and that's how this world works. Uh, similar to a, a seesaw, but in the end, we find solutions. Um, some a, a organization already tried to solve these issues with MDRs, for example, meaning to shift the, the load from an internal team to an external team. Um, but there are challenges there as well. I'm not going to, to get too deep into it. What Intezer does is tries to solve this issue through automation. Um, the way we do it is by using our SaaS platform and connecting it to re relevant detection sources. We're going to focus on EDRs in this webinar, but we do connect to other alerting sources, uh, either through direct integration that we develop or through uh, third parties like uh, Splunk Phantom, XOR, et cetera. In those cases, just an anecdote, we can connect to other alerting sources like email gateways and others. Now, Intezer here in this um, chart is in the middle. Again, this is a SaaS platform. You don't need to install anything. Everything is connected via REST API. What Intezer can do, we're going to go and drill deep, deeper into it, but essentially what it can do is it can analyze the relevant artifacts from the alerts you're getting. Analyze means you're gonna get a verdict of whether this alert is a true positive, meaning it's it's malicious, or it's, it's a false positive, it's legitimate, or it also might be something in between. And that gray area is very important. I urge you also to see our short demo video on YouTube um, that shows exactly these examples. Here today, I went a bit cra crazy with, with uh, a VM and we'll see what we got. Um, so Intezer is in the middle, it receives information from the alert pipeline. See here Sentinel-1, CrowdStrike. I'm going to, to reveal that we, we added another one to our direct integration. So we're gonna see that as well. We receive that information, which includes the alert itself, all of its metadata, any related files, any related links, et cetera. Um, and we can analyze that. We can also deploy uh, additional tools to scan the machine in a deeper way. We're going to mention that as well. Um, and the information will go back either to the alerting source itself, so in your Sentinel-1 alert, or preferably it can go back to your case management solution. So that could be Jira, XOR, ServiceNow, and any other that you're working with. So the information there will be true positive, false positive, something in between. And based on that information, we can also, for example, automatically close and remediate false positives. And coming very soon, we are also adding a capability to escalate and prioritize alerts. So you get essentially uh, the coverage that you would get from a real SOC team, simply through technology. In addition to updating you know, your case management that hey, this is a false positive, true positive, in true positive, there are additional actions that need to be taken. And uh, I think, you know, we'll, we'll go through, you know, a SOC uh, or incident response cycle uh, very quickly here. And I think everything really makes sense. So you get the detection, you have triage that can be covered by Intezer, but following that, let's say you escalated the alert, uh, because you find it to be malicious and uh, posing a threat to the organization. You must use the investigation and carry on to remediating the machine that alerted because you know the malware at least tried to run there if it didn't uh, also succeed in executing. And in addition to that machine, then you broaden your scope and you need to make sure that that threat or anything related did not find its way to any other machines. 
okay? So that's also what we can provide as part of that disintegration, uh, providing hunting queries that you can then use to properly remediate and properly hunt and do that quickly and easily because it's not a complex process. Uh, it, the complex part is, is usually connecting all of these different uh, solutions that you work with. So that's in short. Of course, we also receive and use threat intelligence data. We can also proactively hunt within the organization just in the day-to-day. Hey, just popping in because I uh, shawl's frozen on my screen and I'm not quite sure if he is for everyone else as well. Um, can someone pop into the, the Q&A and just uh, give me a wave if you can still hear or see shawl? Yeah, I just want to try and confirm if this is just for me or everyone else. Perfect. Okay. It's definitely all of us. No shawl. Okay. So apologies. I'm going to be picking up for a hot moment while Shaw drops out. What I'm going to do for the first thing is I'm actually going to, because I don't have the slides up, but what I can do is pop over to one of the examples that I know that he is going to be showing in a moment. So, um, okay. Gonna, oh, Shaw jumps back in. <laughs> hey there, All we good, lost guys. you for a second. I was just saying that you were about to jump over to the actual demo and start showing off you know, from the alerting source with Sentinel-1 to show uh, some samples. So we're going to start, um, I think, moving over to that next. Good save, Shannon. <laughs> um, I just got disconnected, closed the VPN. I'm back. I'm sorry. We'll cut it in the recording and we'll be fine. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with us. So I'm just finishing here. Collection. <laughs> what we see here is where we're connected to. So here we have Sentinel-1 as the main collection source. We also have manual uploads, XOR uploads, and to the big reveal, if you connect source, click on connect sources here, you can see that we have also added Microsoft Defender. So now we support CrowdStrike, Sentinel-1, Microsoft Defender, and of course, the SOAR of your choosing. If I want to connect Sentinel-1, uh, let's say you haven't done this, uh, already, and you can actually do it right now. Um, I can choose here, connect, and provide my API token, since SN1 is a URL, and follow the instructions, and you'll be connected. Going back, uh, following the connection stage, all the information comes uh, to us through that integration. Again, SAS, the connection is on our side, so it's about a, a minute or two. It, it's up and you can see already in this environment this is one of our clients you have about 50 percent no threats this means that 50 percent of all of the alerts are false positives and about 25 percent about a quarter of these alerts are true positives further than that you also get the classification of these different threats so you can understand that okay i have quackbot that's something I, I, I want to focus on, but hack tools, Softonic, Adware, Fusion Core, less interesting. So it gives you a very clear view of what's going on. Okay, so that's our dashboard. Now moving on to how it looks like on Sentinel-1, which of course has disconnected on me while my internet was disconnected. So bear with me again. As I log in. Shaw, which sample are you going to start with on this one? It's going to be. Do you want to start with the Remco's one? Most likely. Okay. Just need to concentrate for multi factor authentication. While Shaw's doing that, this is the link for one of the samples that Shal is going to be showing through Sentinel-1 that links into our analysis reports. Yeah. So if you're logged in as a user, you can pull this up and start digging into that example for yourself and clicking around while he's yeah. showing, you know, yeah. how and, 
get you. And you can share both, Shannon, because I'm going to go, you know, uh, through them and, and, you know, people might have questions if they find something there. So I'm back in Sentinel One, going to incidents. And as you can see, I've had a party yesterday with the uh, monitored machine. And I'm going to focus only on a few here, but just so you can see, um, if I just click on this one, for example, you can see we have an alert. It was mitigated, killed, quarantined. And I, in order for me to understand actually what, what was this, uh, I can see Intizer tells me this is a confirmed threat, async rat. I have four indicators I can use. Um, and the code here, was seen previously in many other samples. Um, so this is what Intuzer provides, that verdict, that classification. Now, why do I need this? If I see here again that the, this was mitigated and killed. Um, and it's a great question. <laughs> Thank me for asking. Um, even though most of the threats will be, if they are detected, terminated, mitigated, quarantined, you don't know exactly when that happened. So they might have executed through a multi-stage process and some parts of that malware might have been activated. Hopefully, during our investigation here, we won't find anything. However, it's always critical to check because I'll show you examples later, but even when a threat is said to be killed, it might have copied itself um, using a variety of techniques, which means it might be still up and running. So I'm going to start with this example. Um, so this is the async rat one uh, that Shannon sent you. So again, what do I see here? I see the path. This is the file that was located on the temp directory. Uh, I can see that, again, this was first seen today in this case. Um, and I see which endpoint is involved here. Threat indicators, I don't have anything. So in order for me as an analyst now to be able to respond, I need to get in further. Um, now, again, as part of the triage process, this is now escalated, okay? This is a true positive, so I know I need to deal with it. Okay. How does Intuzer work, by the way? So we take the file here, we can analyze the code, since this is a, a binary file uh, compiled uh, with a uh, .NET, we can uh, break it down and actually find classifications based on where that code has been seen before. So this is what we see here. Most of the code here is generic here. This is not a complex threat async rat, but we do have a very clear classification for it. Every piece of this process is analyzed statically, but through its execution, we also receive a huge amount of behavioral data that can be used. So first, if I want to know what this is, okay, it's an open source remote administration tool, which means it allows for communication, CNC, the ability potentially to steal information or interact with the infected machine. If I want to know how it might have affected my machine in the organization, I'll go here to the top to TTPs. Important to note, there's a ton of information here, but you only need a small bit of it in order to properly remediate and, and, and finish up an alert. Under TTPs, I can understand based on its behavior what the threat attempted to do. So it does have some evasion uh, capabilities. Luckily, I'm not using Sandboxy. I do see that it has the ability to install itself at the Windows startup directory. That's important to know, and that's something that I would need to look for on that machine. In addition, it creates a copy of itself in the app data roaming directory. So all of that needs to be looked for on that machine. Uh, do we see it communicating here? Not currently, but let's look at the next tab, detect and hunt. Detect and hunt collects artifacts that are found through behavior, which can be queried for. So TTPs tells us what kind of capabilities, what it tried to do, how that might affect us. How does that map on the MITRE attack matrix? Detect and hunt tells me, take this data, look it up. If you find something, 
something's wrong. And, and that's a very easy flow to work through. Detect and hunt, as you can see here, it's not your typical IOCs tab. IOCs are usually limited to hashes and network addresses, which are very quickly changing between different variants. You'll find them here, but you also can find registry keys, command lines, um, um, process tree structures, file paths, etc. because we have the ability to take all of this information and classify it. Essentially, check if any of those registry keys, file paths, etc., were previously seen or used by trusted software. If they were, they won't be good for detection. If they weren't, they might be. So let's start hunting. Uh, what I can do here is first, let's filter based on network. What I'm doing here basically is this is the CNC address, right? This is the only network indicator. I have an IP. I have a DNS name that uh, is communicated to. Um, so let's try to look for it in Sentinel-1. Sentinel-1 is great for collecting data uh, continuously so that we can look, look it up and understand you know, the activity, the behavior that happened on the machine at that time. So um, Sentinel-1 has their own query language. So let's say I want to start querying, start hunting. I can click here on hunt now, or I can also just choose here visibility. This is the, the deep visibility feature. And you can see that automatically it creates this query that looks for the, the SHA-1 hash of that file. That's great. It would show me where that file was, but it doesn't tell me, did it execute? Did it compromise the machine? Did it spread across the organization? Did it exfiltrate data? It doesn't tell me that. So I don't need to learn the language here, even though there are excellent cheat sheets. I only need to choose, let's choose the IP and the DNS name. I click here on extract rules, Sentinel-1, and that's it. So what it does is it downloads a, a text file, which I'll show you now, which contains the relevant queries. So you can see all of the information, also good for logging purposes. Uh, and this is looking for a network IP associated with this malware. Here it is. And this query does the same for the DNS name. Let's start with a DNS because you know that, you know, if the malware tries to, to connect to it, it'll first uh, run the DNS request, uh, but you can do either. So let's just paste it here and run. If it executed and tried to connect to CNC, it makes sense that first the DNS query was done. Anyway, we'll try for both. So far, not finding anything and no findings. Let's look for the IP. And most likely we won't find it. This is good news because in a real case, if you don't find any network communication, that means that the malware either it wasn't able to or was blocked from carrying this out. Of course, we would also want to look for any scheduled tasks that were done as, as we saw are possible. So no networking outside, that's a great start. Let's look for this command line. So process commands, and we can see here the uh, scheduled task command. So as we saw earlier, it does try to create a scheduled task using the following command. So again, I'll choose this command extra rule sentinel one i can also choose a bunch and just start and i'll copy this one cmd line regex again no one needs to remember the, the syntax you can generate it very easily okay so did we see this command being executed well actually it's not the uh, schedule task one this one executes a batch script that should also be used for persistence. So let's check for this one. 
Great. So honestly, it looks like this one, async rat, was terminated on time and mitigated. We haven't seen any network communication, not on the machine and not in, on any other machine. So let's move on. You see how easy this is when uh, using those indicators. OK, so let's move to another alert this one called mousetrap. You can see that, again, it's a file that was executed this time from a directory on the desktop and already, and you have this example, so you can open it. Uh, you can see that the classification is for Remcos. So it's another type of malware, a bit more advanced than async rat. Um, so already we get the recommendation. You can block it, quarantine, apply IOCs. We already see that it was mitigated and killed, but the same questions arise. We do see that there are evasion techniques, so it is uh, better to, to uh, go inside and try to see what it attempted. This one, you can see already it's more complex. So in the first layer that you see here on the screen, you don't see any malicious code. Hey, Shal, are you still, sh are you showing something or just notepad? Oh, sh sorry. We're seeing notepad right now. Thanks to everyone who jumped into the chat just to tell us the uh, he needed to switch the screen there. Sorry about that. The secrets of screen sharing. This is, uh, you were talking about a mousetrap sample, I think, that none of us saw. Oh, yeah, here. Yeah. Okay. This is what I was showing. We're on the same page. About. Sorry about that, everyone. Thanks. So I, I saw this and I clicked here. You saw, again, defense evasion, and here we are. I was starting to say that this already looks more advanced than what we saw earlier, uh, because as you can see in the first layer here of the malware, um, we don't see any malicious code. You see library code, trusted code, uh, even Microsoft code, um, but we do identify a potential packing, um, which means we will unpack the malware. And you can see this already happened. This is where we got the classification from. So the file executes and we identify new code loaded into memory. We dump it, analyze it, and we get a very clear classification. Now, what is Remcos? Uh, remote control, surveillance software, remote access. So again, we can expect network communication, either for receiving commands, exfiltrating information, uploading data, etc. So once we know this, and we can, of course, dig deeper into it here, again, let's go through the same process. Let's go to TTPs and see what it can do. It has evasion capabilities through injection. It also, it tries to create a scheduled task. We'll look it up as well. Um, let's see under detect and hunt where it tries to communicate to. So again, network. And again, we have this address, this DNS address. Let's try again. This time you saw the notepad for enough, uh, for, for, for long enough. So I'm just gonna copy these requests as you saw them. Again, hunt now. And here you can see, again, I'm looking for a DNS request, including the following DNS address. Data fetched. So this one does uh, show us a result. We do see one record showing that the DNS address was resolved uh, for this name, which means the response was the IP. That's how DNS works, obviously. So first things first, this malware was executed, which means let's try to see what happened next. So the second query I have here is for that IP address. If we get a match for the IP address, it means that following the DNS, uh, uh, resolving an actual uh, connection, perhaps HTTP or any other uh, port, uh, try to connect to the CNC. 27 actions. Okay, so what we see here is repeated attempts. Again, we, we don't know what happened yet. Uh, to connect from this file, from this process, to that address that we saw. This is the IP, source port, etc. cetera. The, the destination port, uh, which was used probably for um, uh, 
trying to, to establish that connection with the CNC. All of this is outgoing because we did specify destination IP, but this is important. The result of this, uh, all of these uh, uh, connection attempts were a failure, which means either this is blocked or the connection was refused or the CNC is down. That happens all the time. Um, if you don't use a very fresh malware, of course. Um, we can also check an enter. And again, um, this is also starting to be more of forensic investigation. You don't have to do this, but it's so easy with enter. So if I want, I can just go and scan that as a URL and I'll get you know a confirmation that the, the, the URL is offline. If it wasn't, we'd give you the uh, full uh, you know, classification of that. So first thing, again, as I, as I mentioned, there was communication, the malware did execute, which means this is, it's accurate, probably it was mitigated, but it did have time to carry out actions. And that's very important to know. Um, and that's why we provide this information uh, because if you know or think it's mitigated and you continue, you might have uh, a lot of, of work to do after. Uh, so again, everything failure. Let's make sure also when the IP is not only the destination, just to be safe. Now, while it looks for that, I also want to search for the schedule task, if you remember. So again, I'm extracting the rule for the command that tried to create the schedule task. It's a longer one. Let's just see the results here. 27 actions. So again, it's the same, no inbound. Next, CMD line. And this is what we extracted. So this is a schedule task create a command that actually refers to a path on temp. You can see that the wildcards, extra slashes, uh, um, quote marks, all were added automatically as part of generating the rule to match uh, the format, the syntax for the query language here. We don't see anything. It sometimes might be tricky. So let's try to at least cut it down a little bit because any change in the path in the name might be critical. If we do find matches, which hurrah, we did, um, and we'll go over it in a sec, this means that command, a command like this was executed on the machine. Also, again, this means that an attempt at persistence was made. Let's try to see what happened here. Schedule task, create, all of them have the same name and check it out. So the task's name is just random letters, but the task in action is executing mousetrap. So classic persistence here, guys, exactly as we saw on detect and hunt and on the TTPs. So the question is, did this task was this task actually created? Was it created and deleted? Was it blocked? So here I'll just try something. I know that uh, I'm a bit familiar with the format, luckily. So let's look for task name is any case. Any case means it can be you know capital or lowercase. And I just want to look for this name. If it's there, it means we have an actual scheduled task. This means that the malware achieved persistence. So we're looking and nothing is found. That means it was either not created or deleted afterwards. Now, let's stop for a sec and uh, do a, a quick recap of what we saw. We saw two different malware alerts. They were both said to be mitigated. Intezer's note, which uh, um, was added automatically, gave us the classification for it. So we know that it is a true positive. 
Me as an analyst, if I see async rat and remcos, I'm starting with remcos. Um, and you know, when you have a lot of alerts, knowing the classification is very important for prioritization. And as I mentioned, this is also going to happen automatically quite soon uh, using automatic uh, prioritization and escalation. Now, using the analysis itself, we were able to see what the file tried to do or attempted to do on the machine. This is something that we need to, to see in order to find persistence, in order to remediate the machine. And then we also use detect and hunt to uh, identify relevant artifacts that can be used for hunting. Um, we generated the query on the async rat one. Nothing was found. It was mitigated completely, probably didn't even execute. On the REMCOS example that you can see, um, we did find a significant amount of data. We did see that network communication was attempted, but blocked. And we also saw that there was an attempt to create a scheduled task, which in the end looks like was not created or deleted. So all of that was done very quickly, semi-automatically, semi-manually by myself. Important to note that uh, our roadmap for this year is very much focused on closing all those gaps that are currently still manual. Although this process already was very fast for a malware investigation, a hunting, uh, but uh, what we do plan is, you know, when this is escalated, to already take the analysis and create and run those hunting queries for you. So when you reach that alert, you already know what I found out here. You already know that there were network communication, there were a schedule, there was a scheduled task, for example. So you know what to look for exactly in the moment that you start. So that's where we're going. And you can see that the technology is there. There are a few more, you know, connections that need to be made. Now, I'm going to show you another uh, capability that Indizer has that can be really relevant in these cases, especially in this Remcos one, because I don't know, I'm not sure because of you know, the, the mixed information, whether it was properly mitigated or not. What we can do at Intezer is also through our integration is trigger an automatic action uh, or a, another scan of the machine. In the real, you know, <laughs> real world, no automation, what you'd need to do to properly make sure that the machine is clean is run a full forensic analysis. And I'm sure everyone here knows that no one's got time for that. Um, it's very rare that uh, an organization has a forensics team. And even if one of the analysts does know how to take a memory dump, analyze the memory dump, um, you have another, other alerts <laughs> to take care of. So using Intezer, you can do the following. So uh, I'll go back to the incident. Let's go to mousetrap. And what I can do here uh, under actions is choose to run a script. This is something I configured beforehand. You can actually, uh, you have the documentation uh, for how to do that exactly, step-by-step step on our documentation. And I can choose here to run the Intezer endpoint scanner. What I would need then to do is provide my API key, you wish, and say, no, 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 no output. Okay, next, next, it's done. Within a few minutes, you will get a full memory scan of the machine. Now, I've done that beforehand, so I can show you some examples. Um, but if you run it, you know, as soon as you got the alert, and that's also something that we're going to connect, so it happens automatically for certain types of alerts, uh, you, it means that you get a full forensic analysis automatically within about five minutes of that detection. That's extremely, extremely helpful. So let's see how that might look like. So this is a file analysis. Again, this is what we saw earlier, this, and the same for async rat. An endpoint analysis would look something like this. This is a, the, a clean machine. So this is what I would expect if the machine was properly mitigated. Um, and you can see here, no threats, and all of the files here, all of the code that is running in memory is trusted. What we do here is actually look at the binaries in memory and analyze them statically as we do best. You can see even the Sentinel-1 code here. Um, 
when the mitigation is not so successful, we can find malware. So we have an agent Tesla example. Oh, and here's mousetrap. So what I did here is just run the scanner after running Remcos. Um, and as you can see, and as could be understood um, from the investigation and from our hunting, it did execute, it did load into memory. Um, and we can see here exactly from where. So the result here shows that you have the file mousetrap, you have the process in memory, and you can see also here we don't have classification due to packing. And once it loads into memory, we do have that classification. And we can see exactly what the process ID here. So that would be what we need to terminate. Um, so this tells us very quickly that machine is still infected. And uh, once you, you uh, terminate that process, for example, reboot the machine, you know, to make sure no persistence is there, you can run the scan again and you should get a result like this. It's that easy. Now, in addition, um, we, we mentioned scheduled tasks a lot and you, you could see it's something very, very common for malware. Usually they're, they have, uh, you know, they're multidisciplinary, they can use different persistence mechanisms, uh, but schedule tasks is very common. So we've recently added this to our endpoint scanner. So it also collects schedule tasks. And if we look for mousetrap, you know, as the, the uh, executed file, we don't find it here. Uh, and you can also, you know, sort by the registration time and you can see that there, there were no schedule tasks here um, even in the past two years. Uh, so this is how you can clean a machine. The same goes for this one, Agent Tesla. Um, it's another example. We have many more alerts uh, where that came from. And this one actually shows a, a harder case because it's not the original file you know, that was executed to load Agent Tesla. This code was already injected into a legitimate process. So this makes things interesting, uh, but we can go deeper into that maybe in another webinar or if you have any questions. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'd love to, to summarize. We went over the automated flow uh, of a, a triage, analysis, hunting in Intezer. Um, connecting to Sentinel-1, and we did put an emphasis on hunting here because it's something that is usually neglected and it's so simple when you have amazing tools like Sentinel-1 and like Intercer Analyze. Um, I hope that this, you know, put into perspective what an intro response process could be. Um, of course, using these advanced tools, memory forensics automation um, can really help uh, struggling SOC teams. So uh, if there are any questions, I'm really happy to answer. Perfect. Thanks, Shaw. We've got a couple of questions. One of the quick ones specific to Sentinel-1. For the integration on how we connect with Sentinel-1, does Intizer only work with the Sentinel-1 visibility add-on or their capability? which capabilities can you use if you don't have that? Mm. So I know that Sentinel-1 has different packages, the uh, if visibility is not included uh, and there are uh, other searching capabilities, of course, you can use Detect and Hunt for that as well, uh, but it does work best with the visibility and that query language. We are planning to also release um, you know, platform independent query languages, um, which should be, you know, it should be possible to use with, you know, open source systems and other systems. Yeah, so there's definitely other ways to hunt if you don't have visibility using these detection opportunities. Yeah. Um, so you can use it for like Sigma rules, you were saying. Um, right, so exactly, other yeah. kinds of ways, if you're wanting to do these kinds of hunts and don't have access to that particular tier, the rest of the integration um, doesn't require for collection, triage, and response, doesn't necessarily require visibility because it's not getting into the hunting, right? It's just the alerting endpoint part. Yeah, of course. Right. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, I've got another question here. Um, does it anonymize the path? Yeah. In the, I'm hoping you understand well, that one because it's yeah, a little I, bit I, big for me. Yeah, I think I, I know what you mean, uh, whoever asked. Um, so, for example, it, you, you could have seen that some of the uh, artifacts have like the username in the path. And of course, that would be different in our sandbox execution and on that machine. So yeah, it just changes that into 
a wild card. Great, awesome. And so for, for this, the one last kind of quick question just to wrap up, um, you mentioned the, the roadmap and kind of some of the other things that are coming out. The, one of the things that we're, you know, we have here is you've got the, the triage bar and I just kind of want to zoom in on that a little bit. So you've got the, if you're looking through the dashboard, you have the malicious, suspicious, investigate, no threats. And can you just cover that triage bar just a bit? Oh, one of course, more. of course. So as I said in the beginning, um, the first stage in incident response after detection is triage. So that's where you um, decide what's urgent, what's less urgent, what's irrelevant, and what's you know we need to treat right now. Um, and that's what you know most of the work is, or most of the time goes to. So you can see how easily it uh, divides itself automatically. This simply means that. This percentage of alerts were classified by Intezer as false positives. This is possible because we have that unique ability to classify legitimate code. And when you only look at behavior, it's almost impossible to say that something is legit. Um, it's easy to say that something is suspicious. Uh, same goes for malware. This is what we confirm to be malicious. And suspicious usually is those administration tools, hack tools, or you know potentially unwanted software that don't pose a risk, but they might be you know um, not in, in the the organization's, organization's policy. And to investigate means it's unclear, and you can investigate more, but it's not urgent. So first, deal with confirm malicious, and then when you have the time, go through these. And a lot of those to investigate ones, one of the Intezer for suspicious and to investigate Intezer recommends actions for what you want to do next on those. So it's clear that you're not just kind of being like, what do I do next? Um, yeah. From my understanding to investigate the next action for many of those is to run that endpoint scanner and make sure you have, you've collected that endpoint forensics, right? In many cases, and in all other cases also, the alert from Sentinel-1 might not be even related to a file. It might be, you know, a detected injection, for example, or network communication. Something's doing that in memory. So that would be found by the memory uh, scanner. And since it can be automated, um, and it's so easy, quick, and lightweight, you can, and it's also unlimited uh, from the license perspective, so you can go crazy with it. Um, it only helps. Um, and um, also regarding to the to investigate, once we find something that you know previously was unknown, and then we just we, we see and we determine, okay, this was a false positive. You can actually update that, so our system learns that's a false positive, and anything related to that in the future also a false positive. So the system can also learn and improve from knowing your network. Yeah, and from what I understand, um, just to clarify just a little bit more, even is uh, Intezer also has tuning suggestions and uh, you can classify, privately classify scanned code. So if you have proprietary and internal tools that Intezer is gonna say, hey, investigate this, we haven't seen it, it's weird. You can reclassify that. So that way Intezer recognize proprietary and internal things as not threats. And so you can make sure that we can really tune down, you know, what were Intezer is able to automatically uh, show you, hey, this is fine, it's not suspicious, and these are actually malicious. For sure, and um, Shannon, something something related to that is, you know, uh, this is not magic, this is technology, it was researched uh, for, you know, continuously, uh, so any environment is different. So usually there's an onboarding period of like a week once we deploy, deployment also is instantaneous, and usually after that adjustment, you know, it, it, the the uh, coverage is much higher and clearer, but also before that, you also already should be able to see a reduction of false positives. Yeah, perfect. Great. I, that, I think that covers all of the questions. I hope that answered and clarified everything that you all were wondering. Um, oh, wait, one last quick one, Shal. Can you un upload a zip file yes. directly? <laughs> Yes, you can also do anything you want manually with the system. Join the community, analyze.intezer.com. You can integrate and you can also just use it manually and let us know what you think. 
Yeah, so you can see um, through through that, uh, you know, what are the different things that you can scan, zipped files, PDFs, you know, any kind of those files that you have that you might need to look at. It also supports uh, Mac binaries and files, so uh, you'll see lots of different support for almost anything that you can, uh, you'll run into as part of one of those alerts. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.